Good morning. Let's go to Judges chapter 13. Judges 13. We're now beginning the account that our Lord gives us concerning the birth of Samson. Now Samson is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, but Samson is a Nazarite. He's a Nazarite. And a Nazarite would voluntarily take a vow and he or she would do this for some set amount of time that they determined in making this vow to God. It might be a day, a week, it could be several days, it could be a year or several years or many years. But in Samson's case, it's the Lord that dedicated Samson that appointed him to be a Nazarite. And he did it from his conception in the womb all the way to the time that Samson died. He was a Nazarite his whole life. Now I said that Samson was a type of Christ, but understand that Christ himself was not a Nazarite. He drank wine. He touched the dead and raised the dead unto life. Things that were forbidden for a Nazarite to do. But in these early verses, we have pictured for us the fruit of the gospel, what the Lord works in his people, and it's seen and witnessed in the vow of the Nazarite. And our Lord does this for his bride. He, he saves and delivers his bride, and he separates them unto himself, unto his own use and purpose. And so from the first five verses, that's what we'll be looking at, verses 1 through 5, I want to declare to you the gospel, the gospel of our God. Now, to begin, let me say that David wrote, Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, does not charge him with sin, though he's a sinner. Blessed is that man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Now, the natural man thinks that he can become that blessed man. He thinks by his works, by his decisions and life choices that he can be that blessed man whom the Lord looks upon and admires and says, wow, look at this one really straining and struggling and sacrificing to be that blessed man, to earn my favor and merit. And I know this because I am that man by nature. I'm that man by nature. And I was very much caught up in that thought, that mindset, that heroic mindset, that when the dust, settle, that when the dust settles, I'd be that man whom the Lord approves of and says, this is a good man. He's a good man. But it was all built on the flesh. It was all built on what I would do and, and could do or tried to do. And so it is that there's many men and many women that go to hell with that hope. They go to hell dying in their sins, believing that God loved them and that God was well pleased with their good life and their good works, and that they, they die in their sin, being deceived because they thought that they were pleasing God. And so it is that if God will be gracious to you, if God will be gracious to any sinner, he must destroy all vain hopes, all hopes of self-righteousness and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and becoming this, this good, great, sanctified person. It's not going to happen. And God's going to destroy it. He's going to meet it, and he's going to bring it to nothing in his people. He's going to deliver us from those vain, wicked thoughts. Now understand this, that the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Paul writes of this in Galatians 3.22. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. And we have just such a scripture. It's throughout scripture. 
And we have just such an one scripture right here in chapter 13, verse 1, where we read again, <laughs> it's familiar to us, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Now, recognize this is repeated not concerning Moab, not concerning the Ammonites, not concerning the Philistines, but this is speaking of the children of Israel, a type and picture of the church of Christ. This is us by nature. We that are religious, we that think that we bring something to please God with our own works. But the scriptures are showing us again and again, here they are, here you are, here's me, sinning, doing evil again in the sight of the Lord. And it's not only here in Gen Judges 13.1, but we can just look in the book of Judges at Judges 3, verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord strengthened the hand of their enemy, and he ruled over them for a time. Judges 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when their last judge who delivered them was dead. Judges 10, verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. I wouldn't be surprised to know that they thought they were serving the Lord all this time. They were just incorporating a few good ideas from the, the nations surrounding them. They were just bringing in a few little trinkets here and some shiny things there and things that seemed to to glorify God in, in some way and they thought they were serving God. But the reality is they were idolaters. They were idolaters. And that's exactly what every single one of us is by nature. We are idolaters. And what an idolater does is they bring God down to a level that they think that they can meet his standards and requirements. They make God like unto themselves. And so that God becomes one who is of like passions as you and I. And then they whittle away the things that are impossible to do, and they like those things that resonate with them. And that, that sounds good. I like that. I can agree with that. And that becomes their God. And so whatever it is, if it's just showing up every time for service, They'll do it because they're now pleasing their God. Or if whatever it is, they'll make it up and they'll say, that works. That works for me. God will be pleased with that. And, and, and he'll see I'm doing my best and he'll make up for the rest. And we've heard that in, in religion. We've heard that. Even in legalistic law religion, I was told, you do your best and God will bless it. He'll make up the rest. He'll make up the difference for you. That's not the hope of the righteous. That's not the hope of the righteous. That's not what the Lord convinces us of. He shows us that in ourselves, we're wicked. In ourselves, our works are vile and wretched. How is it that God sees the works of man? We know, again, there's many scriptures that we could go to. We could look at David, a man after God's own heart, and the scriptures show us that man being king Brought, made a woman commit adultery against her husband to lay with him. And having committed adultery and trying to, to cover over his sin by bringing in her husband Uriah, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't leave the side of David, so he had him murdered for his faithfulness and loyalty to David. And he had him murdered. And yet God says, that man is a just man before me. So we see the sin. We see that there's nothing to praise us and our works and ourselves. We see that the scriptures conclude we're all sinners. But how does God see the works of man? Well, just before God destroyed the earth with a global flood, he gave this testimony in Genesis 6, verse 5, 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Does that describe you? Does that describe you? That every imagination of the thoughts of your heart is only evil continually? It does me. It does me. If you're a child of God, you know that that is true of you. Even on your best day, all your thoughts and your heart is so mixed with sin and so mixed with the flesh that there's nothing that we could stand before God and say, I didn't sin there. I didn't sin there. Whereas John tells us that if we, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves and, the, and, and we're calling God a liar. The truth of God is not in us and we're saying, no, I, I was good there. I, I did right. I was, I was in the right over there. I did what I should have done right there and should have done there and I was without sin. I was, I'm faultless in that. I'm blameless in that. Well, you're calling God a liar to defend yourself. As God says, no. Every thought, every imagination of the thoughts of our heart is only evil continually in this flesh. That is our, our confession. And I'll tell you why the sinner who knows confesses this to God that his heart is only evil continually. Why does God bring his children to see that all our works are sin? Because that's when we cease working. That's when we stop trying to work a righteousness for ourselves. And we're humbled before God and confess our sin to him and cry out to him for mercy. Lord, save me a sinner. We beat upon our breasts. We can't even lift our head up to heaven. And we cry, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the one whom God the Father had sent to save us. Not you. You don't save yourself. You don't save your brethren. You can't even save yourself. Christ was sent to the Father to lay down his life to deliver his people from their sins. And so that one who confesses that they are a sinner and have no righteousness of their own, that's the confession that the Spirit of God puts into our hearts so that we cease working, we cease trusting in our own righteousness, and we look to the one whom the Father has sent and cry out to God for mercy in him. But the self-righteous man will never confess such a thing because they will go on in their self-righteous works, in their religion, tinkering away on this thing and fixing that and tweaking this in themselves and making this better and getting better and better and better, progressively sanctifying themselves, all the while denying what God is telling us that all men are sinners. Let every man, let God be true and every man a liar. But he's the just one. He's righteous. He's holy and faithful and just. And what are we before God but sinners? Sinners. Desperate for the grace and mercy of God. And the self-righteous does it because he's not that bad. He doesn't have a lot of sins to be forgiven. He just needs a little help here and a little help there. A little reminder a little correction but he, he's got it he's got it under control <clears throat> our Lord Jesus Christ addressed this when he was speaking to the Jews in John 8 28 he said therefore because you're trusting in yourselves and you're not looking to the one whom the father has sent you shall die in your sins for if you believe not that I am he that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ sent of God ye shall die in your sins because the only reason why the Son of God came in the flesh is because there is no law that we can keep that makes us righteous. By God sending his Son into the world in the flesh to die for the sins of his people, it declares we can't do it. We can't do it. We cannot save ourselves. And so if God will be gracious to you, he's going to knock down all your strong towers of self-righteousness and your works and confidence in this flesh, bring you to nothing, 
to, to put your face in the dust before the throne of God at the feet of Christ, crying out, Lord, be merciful to me. And it's, it sounds harsh, but it's merciful. It's gracious of God to make us to, to see our need and to know our need now in the day of grace, that we might hear his salvation and hear the voice of Christ and be healed and comforted and rest in the rest of God. In, in the comfort that God has provided for his people, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> our God has shown us that in Adam, we died in our trespasses and sins. And we're not going to get ourselves out of this pit. We see how Adam tried to do it, right? Adam tried. He ran to the woods, and he sewed fig leaves together. And as soon as he plucked them off the vine, they began to die. And that's what we do in all our works. We just have wilty, droopy things that cannot cover our nakedness. We're just deceiving ourselves. We're, we're, it, God came and, and slew a beast, one for Adam and one for Eve, to show that blood must be spilled. And those beasts were, shed, were, were slain in their place, not that the blood of bulls and goats cleanses us from sin, but they pictured Christ. He was shown then the coming Lamb of God that he had just promised back there in the garden. He had just told them of the promised seed. And so, like Adam in his enmity, the carnal man turns to various religions, and various philosophies, just like you read in Colossians 2, and various traditions of men, touch not, taste not, handle not, which Paul said they're all perishing. All our works are perishing, and they come to nothing. There's no lasting power. They are wood, hay, and stuff. They're things that are going to burn up in that day. And so he turns us from those things because man trusts in those things. He trusts in what he's done. He'll even trust in the law of Moses. But like we see here in our text, like Manoah's wife, we are barren and bear not. We're barren and bear not. Judges 13, verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. Now the name Dan means judge, and the name Manoah means rest, or to seek rest. It, it signifies a, a, the seeking of a marriage for a woman, to give her a cover to protect her, to provide for her. You know, today, it, we don't see the way, we don't know what it is to, to serve a king. We've never been under a king. It's hard for us even to imagine, especially as Americans that are, you know, gun toting John Waynes that can do what we want. You know, we think we're independent and, and free. So we can't imagine serving a king. Well, in the same way, a woman today can go out and get a really good job and make good money and provide for herself everything that she needs. But there was a time, especially back here, where a woman was very dependent on a man. She needed a husband, and if she didn't have a husband, she better be living under her father's roof because she's got no one. She's, she's open to any opportunistic, wicked, evil man at that time. So, so she needs a marriage. She need, That's her rest, and, and that's what the name Manoah signifies. Rest, a marriage for the wife, a head here. And so she's trusting her head. She's laboring in her head, and yet she's barren and bears not. She brings forth no fruit. And see, that's a picture of what we are in Adam. In Adam, all die. In Adam, none of us can bring forth fruit unto our God. We sinned in Adam, and God imputes the sin of Adam to us, because in Adam, we sinned against God. We rebelled against God. And we are born of the seed of Adam. And so we come forth in Adam's image. Right? That image of God which Adam was created in was defiled, ruined, destroyed when he sinned against God. And we inherit that same nature. That seed of Adam is how we are born so that we are not born of, in the image of, of God but in the image of corrupt Adam. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We have no 
life or ability to, to create life in ourselves. And so many turning to various religions and lifestyles and life mottos and creeds, they just boil it down to something that works for them, that resonates for them, and, and, and they think this is their life. And some turn to the law of Moses, believing that they are keeping it. And they do so to justify themselves, or they do so to perfect themselves, or to make themselves holy, to sanctify themselves. That's what they're saying there. But turn over to Romans 7, verse 5. Go to Romans 7, verse 5, and then leave a marker there at Romans 7, because we are going to come back to it shortly. This is describing us in the flesh. As religious as we might be, it's still us in the flesh. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. We labor for rest. We want a cover. We want something to cover our sins and to protect us and to provide for us. And so we strive to fix and correct what was destroyed in us in Adam. We try to fix those things and right our wrongs, but we cannot put away our sin. We cannot justify ourselves before God. We are barren and bear not. Just like Manoah's wife. We're barren and bear not. And no man believes it. No man understands it. No one receives the word of God with understanding because he's naturally of the flesh. He's carnal. That's how we are. We don't understand until God opens our understanding that we might understand the scriptures and believe his word and testimony concerning our sin and our salvation, our Savior. Now we preach the gospel because the Lord commands us to preach this gospel, to bear witness of what the scriptures testify that we're all sinners because I can tell you I read this from cover to cover many many times as a young man and all the while to me I thought I was reading a how-to manual how to correct myself how to fix myself how to raise myself up by degrees and get better and better and more and more holy now I knew Jesus was a component of it I knew he was the son of God I did believe that but I was still so troubled and in such deep darkness, and so tossed to and fro by every wind and wave that came, because constantly when I thought I had arrived, I was knocked back down, and I saw, I thought that was fixed. I thought I already dealt with that and fixed that. No, I didn't. No, I didn't, because the root in me is sin and death and corruption. I don't, by nature, I don't have a spirit. I don't have fellowship with God. I'm enmity against God by nature, and I cannot please God in the flesh. And so we preach this word declaring that no, God says we're all sinners, but he sent his son. And we preach that and proclaim that word because the spirit takes of the things of Christ and shows them unto you, his child, giving us a new birth of the seed of Christ. So that just as as I died in Adam, I sinned in Adam, and I'm born of his corrupt seed and inherit that corrupt nature of Adam, so you, being born of the Spirit of God, who takes the seed of Christ and gives you a new birth in the new man, you, in the new man you inherit the nature of Christ. That's why John says that man cannot sin. That new man can only believe God. In the flesh, we're still dead. In the flesh, we're subject to the law of sin and death. But in the new man, he ever liveth. Because it's Christ. It's Christ's seed in you. The hope of glory. He's, he's, he's the one by whom we believe God and only believe God. And that's why there's that old nature and that new nature always at war until Christ returns and redeems this flesh. Transforms this flesh in that, in that day when he returns. So, the Lord gives us a new birth and it's given to us by grace that we might hear and know and so this is what we see now in verse 3 Judges 13, 3 we'll come back to Romans 7 in a moment Judges 13, 3 and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman 
and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not. See, the Lord comes and, and, and shows us. We, we know, but we don't know. And then the Lord comes and makes it very clear to us. All your labor, all your striving, all your spending for that which is not bread, it's all come to nothing. It hasn't saved you. It hasn't raised you up one cubit of one stature. You're still just as wicked and evil in your flesh as you ever were. You've produced no living fruit. But thou shalt conceive and bear a son. He says there will be life. I'm going to give it. <laughs> I'm going to give you life in you. In, in, your, in, in that new man I will create life. The life of my son I will put in you and give you life and make you fruitful and provide for you and nourish you and feed you and comfort you and give you rest. That rest which you sought from all these wicked vain things, I'll give you rest in my son. You'll be his bride. You'll marry him. You'll be his spotless, holy bride. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who does this. God the Father sent his Son, who came into the world willingly, obedient to the Father in all things, fulfilling all the law of righteousness for his people, doing that which we could not do. He did it for us and with us and works his righteousness in us so that we, we are the very righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. By faith. We receive that atonement, that, that reconciliation of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's purchased us for himself. Now let's go back to Romans 7 and let's pick up in verse 4 and read down to verse 6. And see it in that context. In the context of life in Christ. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. Right? We're dead to those other husbands that could not save us, that could not provide for us. We're dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. We were barren and bared not. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And so the Lord Jesus Christ makes us new creatures. In Christ, all the old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That old husband that you slaved and worked for, he's dead. He's dead. He's not your husband anymore. He has no authority or power over you. Your head, your covering, your salvation, your Savior, your Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father hath appointed. He's perfect and holy, righteous in all his ways and he has provided everything for you child of god everything that you could not do under the law christ has done it all perfectly and so being made alive by christ now we see and understand yes lord all our works all our striving were vain works that could not save and he teaches us and separates us from those things and and shows us how that he is all sufficient he's everything that we need to come to the father and he says this now back in judges 13 4 now therefore beware i pray thee and drink not wine nor strong drink and eat not any unclean thing you see the warning here is that the lord is saying don't look to babylon don't look back to babylon Forget about Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't look back. They have no, no help for you there. There's no goodness, no strength, nothing nourishing or edifying in the dead religion of Babylon. It says over in Revelation 18, I'll be reading from, from there if you want to follow along. Revelation 18, in verse 1, the first thing that we see is the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 18.1 says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, this is the servant of God, as our mediator, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. 
That's exactly what John tells us in, in John chapter 1, that he is the light of men. He is our light. He is our salvation. He is the glory of God. He is the one that has come and brought light into this dark world and shown us that all our works were worthless and could not save. But God is just and holy, and his wrath will destroy the inhabitants of the earth. But in him, in Christ, is our strong tower. He is our salvation. He is the name whereby we must be saved. And we shall be saved in him. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying from the cross, It is finished. And that's what's being said here in Revelation 18 too, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. I've destroyed all your enemies and all that oppose you and stood between you and your God. And I've put away your sins. I've defeated your foes. I've destroyed your sin. I've put it away. I've made a covering with my own blood. And the grave, it can no longer hold you. Death hath no more power over you. I've delivered you from that second death. You have nothing to fear. When you die, you shall be forever with the Lord, you that believe in him. That second death has no power. Nothing to save you. It cannot dictate what your inheritance is. Christ is the one who has given you an inheritance in him. He's opened the door and brought you in and no man can shut it. And no man can push you out. You can't even take yourself out of the hand of Christ or the Father. You're his, secure in him forever, brethren, forever. And he says of Babylon, it's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That was us. That's speaking of, we were right there. We were all following the course of the world. We were all dead in trespasses and sins, following the voice of the prince of the power of the air and, and going right along with the children of wrath and disobedience. That was us. But God, but God, he delivered us. And so he sends forth that word of reconciliation. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. <laughs> you don't want to be there. That, that, there's no life there. That's a place of barrenness, a desert wasteland. It, it's, it cannot save you. There's no life there. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And so when Christ comes, all those old things have passed away. All things are become new. And we come out of those dead works, trusting those dead works, those barren things that brought forth no fruit. We don't look to them anymore. And when we do, our God saves us and delivers us and mercifully brings us out and declares this beautiful, wondrous gospel again and again in our ears to know that's not my hope. That, there's nothing there for me. Christ is all my salvation. Thank you. Thank you for turning me again and again, to look to your son. So we don't continue in the dead letter works. Christ, our, Christ is our Savior, not our religion. Our holiness, our righteousness is not our systematic theology. It's Christ. We, we love doctrine that, that upholds and declares the Lord Jesus Christ. But we come to a person. He's our husband. He's our salvation. He's the one who teaches and instructs us and keeps us. Christ is our Sabbath rest, not the law of Moses. We rest in Christ, not in our keeping of the law. Christ is all. So all the spiritual blessings of God are freely given to us in Christ Jesus. And let's see this in verse 5, uh, Judges 13, verse 5. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now in this is, is a beautiful picture of what Christ our Savior works in his child. We are born in the womb of grace, and we are separated and, 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 and sanctified as holy unto the Lord. We are holiness unto the Lord, because of the, the redemption, the blood redemption of Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm not going to read all of number six, but you could write down number six is where is the chapter where you can read of the vows of the Nazarite. It describes all the vow of the, the Nazarite. But I want to leave you with just a few things regarding this vow that Christ, our Lord and Savior, accomplishes in us as his people, as those that have been set apart for him. If you remember, at the beginning here of Judges 13, the angel of the Lord, which is the pre-incarnate son of God, the pre-incarnate son of God, he's speaking to who? The woman. The woman. He's talking to the church. This woman who pictures the church, and he's making her a Nazarite for a set time while Samson, while she carries Samson in her womb. All right? Now, first, the Lord told Moses in Numbers 6, verse 2, he said, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. So the first thing we see that's beautiful is men and women are no different in Christ. He's the savior of all. He uses men and women in the church. He brings us together. And we all share and are partakers in that one glorious salvation of our God and Savior. And he separates us unto Christ. We are his bride. Together we are one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no difference between the educated and uneducated, the poor or the wealthy, doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter your gender. We're all, all his people are gathered as one in Christ. And we are separated unto Christ who is made unto the believer all. He's made everything to you and to me. Second, the Lord told Moses in Numbers 6, 3, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dry. Right? So this was, this was very strict. It was very strict. He couldn't, you couldn't cook with grapeseed oil. You couldn't add uh, red wine vinegar to your salad, or a little white wine vinegar. Cook, cook your green vegetables, your, your, your green beans with some white wine vinegar. Couldn't use that. That was forbidden. You couldn't eat grapes, and you couldn't eat raisins. Nothing of the vine could you take, no product of the vine. And, and what the Lord's showing us is it's just like the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Had nothing at all to do with it. And so what our Savior does is he tells us, don't come in Christ alone. He tells us, come in Christ alone. Don't mix works with grace. Don't mix Satan with God. There's, there's no, don't mix darkness with light. You're separate from that. Walk in the grace and the light of your God in the face of Jesus Christ. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17 says, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive it. So we come in the blood of Christ, and we don't add our works. We don't think these things add to our justification. What we do is in the heart of thankfulness, thankful for what our God has done. We, we, we rest in Christ and trust him. Third, similarly, similarly to what we just read in Numbers 6.6, 6, it says, All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. You that believe Christ, we don't mix, we don't turn back to the law. That husband is dead. He has no authority over you. We listen to the voice of our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our holiness. He's our perfection. He is our sanctification. So don't turn back to the law of Moses. Paul calls the law, calls the law of Moses a ministration of condemn, no, a ministration of death written and engraven in stones. That's the ministration of death, he said. Don't look back to that which is written on the stones. That's not your rule of life. 
Christ is your rule of life. He's giving you his spirit. And he asks, shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? Shall that not lead you and guide you? Shall Christ not lead you and guide you by his spirit? Is not Christ able? Why should we listen and follow the way of the Pharisees who despised and rejected Christ? They trusted their works in the law. They trusted that the law was their righteousness and they despised Christ. They refused him and said, we'll not have that man reign over us. Why would we turn from Christ? You're turning to the ministration of condemnation rather than the ministration of righteousness. This is all in 2 Corinthians 3. And so those professing to believe on Christ but yet look to Moses, and the law of Moses, Paul says they yet have a veil on their heart. They're yet trying to see God with blindness through a veil on their heart. Nevertheless, he encourages us saying, when it shall turn to the Lord, when the heart of that sinner shall be turned to Christ and Christ alone, the veil shall be taken away. And then fourth and finally, if a man defiled himself before the time of his vow was ended, he had to start over. Number 612 says, but the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And, and what that means is he, if he committed to the Lord a vow to do for a year, and he made it to day 364, and someone dropped dead next to him, he had to start all over. He would make a new sacrifice, shave his head, and begin the, the clock all over, another 365 days. The point is, if, if we've been handling that which cannot save and mixing law with grace or works with Christ, whatever it is, whatever foolishness, forget those things and look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. They're all done. They're all works of stubble and hay and, and they're burned up I see that but I reach forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus that's how we walk we walk in Christ looking to him we're always being corrected we're always being humbled we're always being taught that Christ is all this flesh is constantly getting in the way this flesh is constantly doing and saying and thinking things for which we are ashamed. But look to Christ. His blood is sufficient to save the vilest of sinners. Look to him. Trust him. Believe him. Don't be turned away. Look to Christ alone for all your righteousness. And that final thing he says in Judges 13, 5, he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And what I see in that is, we have the spear. Christ has given us his spear, which has born in us the new man. We carry, as it were, in the womb, Samson. It's been formed in us, that life, that grace, that new man of Christ. And when he returns, he returns. The, the work is, it's finished. Christ has finished the work. Don't, I don't want to cloud that. It's finished. But we still have this struggle and battle as, as we carry this new man in the flesh. But when Christ returns... This flesh will be put down and we shall be transformed in the image of Christ where we shall see him as he is and we shall have a body fit for heaven to dwell with him forever and ever. So rejoice, brethren, rejoice in him for then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I pray the Lord bless that word to you.